Welcome to AP Calculus Unit 2. This unit essentially is all about derivatives and therefore is pretty long on the surface, when in actuality it really isn't that bad. This unit is worth 10 to 12% on the AB exam and 4 to 7% on the BC exam. A quick reminder that I have had to teach myself this course to be able to make this video. And once again, all I ask in return for this is just to please follow my Instagram, link in description. Anyway, let's get into Unit 2. So let's review a few things about rate of change. I'm sure you remember the slope slash rate of change formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. To find the average rate of change over an interval, you take the coordinates of the start and end point, label them accordingly, and plug them into that formula, and solve. Pretty simple, so let's do some transforming. Now let's call the interval we are finding the rate of change on a to b. So now the formula turns into f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So if you're finding rate of change over an interval, this is the formula you use period. A reminder that when you do find the average rate of change over an interval, you're simply finding the slope of the secant line created in that interval between those two points. Now let's talk about the rate of change at one point in a function, which is known as instantaneous rate of change. I taught you back in pre-calculus that the way to find this is by taking the xy coordinate of that point, and taking the xy coordinate of a point plus 0.001 away, labeling them, and then plugging them into the average rate of change formula to get an estimation on the instantaneous rate of change. This would give us an estimation of the slope of the tangent line. The issue is that it is still technically a secant line with this method, therefore it isn't perfect. New formulas in calculus, however, make the way to find instantaneous rate of change perfect. Here are your new formulas for instantaneous rate of change. So should I like pause the screen right now? I don't really know what I'm supposed to do here. So you might be wondering two things looking at these formulas. What is h and what is a? Well, a is simply the x in the function, so that's pretty easy. h, however, offers for some explaining. Back when we talked about the slope of a secant line, h is the horizontal distance between those two points creating the secant line. But here's the catch. For an instantaneous rate of change, we want only one point, the tangent line. So if you're like me the first time I saw this, you're probably thinking, wait, then wouldn't h equal zero because there's only one point? And that's exactly why the limit is in this formula. We don't set h equal to zero, we let h get closer and closer to zero, and watch what value the secant slope approaches. Whatever number you get as the answer is the exact slope of the tangent line, not just some puny approximation. And that slope is the instantaneous rate of change. So let's do an example of using these formulas. This one. Find the instantaneous rate of change of x equals 2 in the function f of x equals x squared. Let's start with the first formula. First we plug in 2 for a. Now we need to plug in 2 plus h into the original function, so we get 2 plus h squared, and we have to plug in 2 into the original function, so we get 2 squared. So now let's simplify the numerator by first foiling, then these two 4s would cancel out, now we can factor an h out of our numerator, then we cancel h out of the denominator, and look at that, now we can do direct substitution to find the limit. So 4 plus 0 is equal to 4, and that would be the instantaneous rate of change, or you could call it the slope of the tangent line, at x equals 2. Now let's quickly do the alternative way you can do by using the other formula. First we plug everything in, then simplify the numerator, then we foil the numerator, cancel out the x minus 2s, and now we can use direct substitution and we get 4, just like in our other formula. So, as nicely as I possibly can say, you need to memorize both of these formulas. They are very, very important. To show you an example, let me show you a question you could get on the AP exam. This question has you just given the limit formula already filled out, and it asks you to find the original function and what x values you are finding the instantaneous rate of change at. All you have to do here is take the skeleton formula and decipher each part of the function from that and take whatever the a value is as the x. All right, now that leads us into a word that I am very scared to learn the definition of. Oh god, why don't we figure this out together? Wait, are you f kidding me? So, so turns out that this whole big scary derivative word, it is just what we've been doing this entire time. The derivative is literally the instantaneous rate of change at a point. All right, now back to pretending like I know what I'm talking about. So derivatives, like I said earlier, they are literally the exact thing we've been doing this video, the instantaneous rate of change. The way we find it is with the same formulas you just learned. The notation is a little different. You will either get this notation, which is known as f prime of x, or you could get this 
one, which is the derivative of y with respect to x. Both of these refer to finding derivatives. So you know that whole process you just went through earlier to find the rate of change at one point? Yeah, there is much easier ways to find that. Right now, we are going to go over the first way. We will use the same example, finding the derivative of f of x equals x squared at the point x equals 2. We already know earlier that the answer is 4, but let's try a different way. Instead of plugging in a singular point to this formula every time we want the slope at a point, we can create an entire derivative function. That function gives us the instantaneous rate of change at any point in the original function instantly. This time we're going to derive the derivative function of x squared. So let's ignore the 2 for right now and just plug in the function x squared to our limit formula. Let's FOIL, then these cancel out, factor out an h, cancel out the h's, and then do direct substitution and the derivative function becomes y equals 2x. Now it becomes marginally easier to find the instantaneous rate of change, sorry, derivative of any x point in this function. So say I wanted to find the derivative of x equals 6 of y equals x squared. Easy, plug it into the derivative function, and the answer is 12. Going back to our problem from earlier, we plug in 2, and we get 4. If you remember, on the graph, this makes a tangent line only going through that point at x equals 2. The slope of that tangent line, or our derivative, is 4. So here's a question. How do we find the equation for this tangent line function? This is where we use something I think it is fair to say all math students hate, and I personally have immense PTSD over. Point slope form. Ew! It's actually pretty simple. It's just one y minus your y coordinate is equal to the derivative multiplied by x minus your x coordinate. But still, ew. Now let's bust out the dusty old calculator real quick. Here you can just skip the entire derivative solving process and press the math button, then scroll down to the eighth option, you plug in with respect to x, then the function you are trying to find the derivative of, then the point you are finding the derivative at, and it solves it for you. Isn't that fun? Alright, moving on. Differenti- differentiability. Dif oh my, differentiability, 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 differentiability. If a function is differentiable, it will have a well-defined slope throughout it and will be relatively smooth. And in case you're wondering why I just defined a random word, differentiability is important because a function will only have a derivative function if the function is differentiable. Let's go over three things that will cause functions not to be differentiable. The first one is obvious. Any sort of discontinuity will cause the function not to be differentiable. A corner or cusp is kind of like a sharp curve on a graph. A good example is the function the absolute value of x. You see a sharp turn in the middle where the slopes of the left and right sides are completely different. This makes it so you can't take the derivative of x equals 0 and therefore the function is not differentiable. And finally the last thing is vertical tangents. It's just as the name implies, anywhere on the graph where the tangent line created would be perfectly vertical. Because obviously a perfectly vertical line on any graph is undefined. So if a function has any of these, it cannot have a derivative function meaning it isn't differentiable. Alright, you've made it this far in the video. Now we will simply cover tricks to find derivatives faster for the entire rest of the video. Let's start with the nice and easy rules. The first thing to know is that the derivative of a constant is 0. So the derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of 500 is 0. The constant multiple rule says that the derivative of a constant times a function is just the constant multiplied by the derivative of that function. A good example here is y equals 7x. The derivative would just be 7 times the derivative of x. And the derivative of x is 1, so the answer is 7. And the final rule is the sum and difference rule, which states that the derivative of f of x plus or minus g of x is equal to f prime of x plus or minus g prime of x. So just like we found earlier, the derivative of x is 1. So if the function was the derivative of y equals x plus x, then the answer would be 1 plus 1, which would just be 2. Now let's go over what the derivative of all of these equal. The derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative the derivative of an exponential function a to the power of x is a to the power of x times the natural log of a. So that means if you were to change it to e to the power of x, the derivative becomes e to the power of x times the natural log of e, but since the natural log of e is just 1, the derivative of e to the power of x would just be e to the power of x. The derivative of log base e of x, or just the natural log of x, is equal to 1 over x times 1 over the natural log of e, which would just be 1 over x times 1 over 1, which would just be 1 over x. 
X. Now we have three rules to talk about. Each of them will help you a lot in your journey finding derivatives. The power rule states for the function f of x equals x to the n, the derivative will be n times x to the n minus 1. That means if you ever have a function to the power of something, which happens in most every function, the derivative will just be whatever that power is multiplied times that function with the power getting subtracted by 1. The product rule states that for a function u of x times v of x, the derivative will be u prime of x times v of x plus u of x times v prime of x. This one means that if you have two functions multiplying by one another, you find the derivatives of each singular function, plug it into this formula, and simplify, and you get your derivative function. And finally, the quotient rule states that for a function u of x divided by v of x, the derivative is the product rule with a minus instead of a plus over v of x squared. So for this function, we find each its respective derivatives, plug it into the formula, simplify, and we get our derivative function. Finally, now you have the rest of the trig functions. What are their derivatives? Simple, secant squared of x, negative cosecant squared of x, secant of x times tangent of x, and negative cosecant of x times cotangent of x. You'll need to memorize these too, but I'm sure you can find some patterns to help you memorize them. Okay, now that we're done with the rules slash tricks, on the screen now is every single one I went over. This is the wondrous and glorious time where you pause and do your best to memorize everything. All good? Good. Now let's close this video with a few examples of using these tricks to find derivatives. And just a quick reminder before we do that, these limit formulas from earlier will always work to find derivatives. If you ever forget any of these tricks or you just don't want to use them, you can always use these limit formulas and they will work. Now let's try this example. This might look complex to find the derivative of, but it is really easy now all because of one rule. The power rule. The way we find the derivative is going term by term. So you Use the power rule on 3x cubed to get 9x squared, again the power rule on negative 4x squared to get negative 8x, again the power rule on 7x to get 7, and since 18 is a constant, its derivative is 0, meaning the final derivative function for this polynomial is this. See how easy that was? But what about this example? This looks like a prime example of the product rule, so for this rule I need to find the derivative of each term, then I label them, then I plug it into the rule and simplifying, this would be our derivative function. And I could go over more examples, but I'd rather just have you guys practice. So on the screen now are a few more examples you can try on your own. Pause now. I'm gonna go ahead and put the work and answers on the screen now. And you know what? Why don't we call the video there? Unit 2 is finished, and I feel a lot better now, don't you? But whoa, 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 don't click off the video just yet. To go along with my ritual, please watch this video and subscribe to this channel. It is my non-educational channel, and I'd really like to see it get to a thousand subs, so please help me out. Okay, come on, why are you still here? Just click on the dang channel already, come on.